So, hi everyone, welcome to the RISD Fulbright webinar. Um, I'm RISD's Fulbright Program Advisor, and with me tonight we have Jessie Liu, who received her RISD BFA in textiles in 2016 and a Fulbright to Taiwan, and Mandy Lee, who received a RISD MFA in glass in 2022 and a Fulbright to the Czech Republic. Hello, Jesse and Mandy, and thank you so much. So Jesse right now is in Taiwan and it's 8 a.m. And Mandy is in the Czech Republic and it is 1 a.m. So thank you so much for being here. And Jesse and Alan, it is our job to keep Mandy awake. And all of you can help by asking some really great questions at the end um, to keep her awake. So thank you so much for being here during your Fulbright experience. It is, it's really, it makes it that much more exciting. And we also have with us Alan Tracy, our RISD Careers Communication and Program Manager, who is a fantastic RISD Fulbright reviewer, and he's going to be pulling the strings tonight and facilitating the Q&A. So hello, Alan, and um, you wanted to go over a couple of Zoom things. Sure. Thank you, Lisa, um, and welcome, Jesse and Mandy. Um, so everybody, just a couple of quick housekeeping notes. We've turned the chat off. Um, that's for outgoing. We will send you links to um, websites and things like that. I've just shared um, some guidelines for interaction. And, um, you know, the, the bottom line there is basically we have um, turned the chat off. So please, please use the Q&A. You can use it the whole time. We'll keep an eye on it and we'll get to as many questions as possible. Um, but get those out there while they're on your mind. And then you can, um, you know, we'll, we'll cover those once the presentations are over. And um, one of the, the biggest things is there's um, captioning available. So in the bottom of your Zoom bar, you can turn the captioning on if you wish to follow along that way. And um, you know we're all experiencing things differently in the world. There's a lot happening around the world um, and right here at home. And um, you know we just ask that you be kind in your interactions and questions. Um, and otherwise, that's it. Like, ready back over to you, Lisa. Great. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I am going to first play a video tutorial on all things Fulbright. I recorded this in advance, so we streamline all the information and be sure you have everything you need in one place. So this video actually is from 2022 because Fulbright 2023 actually hasn't started yet. It opens in April. So I will update this tutorial in April, but know that while there might be some minor changes, there's the heart of everything is just not going to change. So you can watch this anytime. And again, when you look at this again in April, it might be slightly different. After the video, we're going to hear from Mandy and Jesse, and then we're going to have an open Q&A discussion. And we really hope you stick around as there's a lot of learning that happens from hearing from your peers with questions and having the opportunity to talk to two Fulbrighters who are in their experience right now. And the application process wasn't that long ago, so it's fairly fresh, I think. Hi, everyone. Hi. Welcome to all things Fulbright U.S. Student Program for RISD artists and designers. The Fulbright U.S. Student Program provides six to 12 month fully funded grants abroad for graduating students and recent graduates to conduct individually designed research projects, enroll in graduate school, or teach English. I'm Lisa Kramer. I'm RISD's Fulbright Program Advisor, or FPA. Fulbright is an intense process. My job is to make it more exciting rather than overwhelming and to help you understand the process and mission so you learn and grow from each step. I'm here to help you at all stages of the application cycle, pull all the pieces together into a compelling proposal, no matter your discipline or project content. Fulbright is also a long process. To briefly outline the timeline, you will start working on this in the winter or spring, maybe even earlier. Things will intensify during the summer as you pull all the pieces together you will submit early fall. Then the following spring, you are notified of the decision. Grants begin late summer or fall, a year after you submitted, or even the winter of the next year for some countries. Once you start the application process, the grant is a good year away. So if you are intending to apply this year, great. Consider that you will need to get set some time aside for Fulbright between spring through September. If you are interested in next year or the year after, also great, it is never too early to start thinking about a Fulbright grant. Some can pull this off in five to six months, but many take one to two years to develop their proposal. In any case, you are here now and will learn a great deal, no matter how far you go in a Fulbright exploration. So about Fulbright, 
The mission is to foster mutual understanding between nations, advance knowledge across communities, and improve lives around the world. It was created by Congress in 1946 to promote international goodwill through the exchange of students in the fields of education, culture, and science. It is sponsored by the U.S. Department of State's Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs. It is administered in the U.S. by the Institute of International Education, IIE, and it is administered overseas by binational commissions and U.S. embassies. This is a government grant, which you should keep in mind as you consider your audience. It is also very important that you always keep in mind that Fulbright is at heart about meaningful cross-cultural exchange. This grant is open to graduating seniors and fifth year students. You may begin the process in your junior year or fourth year, but won't be able to submit an application until the fall of your senior year or fifth year. To graduate students and to recent graduates, know that you can apply through RISD up to three years after graduation. You must be a U.S. citizen by the application deadline, have a bachelor's degree by the start of the grant, be proficient in the language of the host country, and have limited experience in the host country. For most programs, applicants who have had extensive recent experience in the host country or extensive foreign experience may be at a competitive disadvantage, but still are eligible to apply. Plus, there are unique country-specific requirements. Know that diversity and inclusion are cornerstone principles of Fulbright. Fulbright's goal is to have a program that represents the diversity that makes up the U.S. There are two main grants. The Study Research Grant, which is independent research, study, or arts projects abroad for six to 12 months offered in 140 countries. English teaching assistantships are an opportunity for you to help teach English and U.S. culture in a classroom for eight to 10 months offered in 75 countries. I'm gonna focus on the study research grant as that is what most RISD students are interested in. But no, we are happy to help you with an ETA application too. Keep in mind though, that an ETA opportunity comes with the expectation that you have experience in teaching, experience in working with non-native English speakers, specific teaching ideas and methods, and can make clear connections as to why teaching English will support your long-term goals. If you are applying for a study research grant in the creative arts, you will need a well-developed project and or study plan that in Fulbright's words, improves your craft which means art and design making needs to be central in the study, research, and outcomes. You will need to make your case for participating, learning, and growing as an artist. You need to develop and document a host country affiliation relationship. This might be with a university, research think tank, lab, library, community organization, or nonprofit, in which you receive mentorship and critique, maybe access to facilities or equipment. Perhaps you are taking a class or workshop. Plus, you could be supporting their research or class or assisting in a production or conference. You will need a compelling visual portfolio that supports your proposed grant activities. Consider that your portfolio will be reviewed by U.S. artists and designers and host country experts who are likely not all artists and designers. You need to include meaningful host country community engagement and have a high level of academic, professional, and or artistic achievement. And demonstrated leadership, flexibility, adaptability, and openness. What are the award benefits? Round trip airfare, a monthly stipend, oxygen and sickness benefits, and other possible benefits depending on the host country. Once you return from a Fulbright experience, you will have gained new skills, perspectives, and insights that will influence you for the rest of your life, along with Fulbright being a great opportunity to build your network overseas. One of the most common questions about benefits is, can I defer my loans while I'm on a Fulbright grant for a year? And the answer is yes. What does a Fulbright project look like? It is so hard to define. There are so many variables from your skills and interests to your affiliates area of expertise. And there are 140 countries, each with their own interests and requirements. The possibilities are endless, but there are basically three broad types with lots of gray area in between. Independent study research is the traditional Fulbright Ward in which you design a project from beginning to end that allows you to work with people of the host country to mutually advance in your field of interest. Some countries offer graduate enrollment as an option. In this case, the program, activities, and outcomes are set. It's graduate study. However, this can be tricky as you have to make a strong case for this isn't just about funding for graduate study. Why is this a Fulbright? 
What is a meaningful cross-cultural exchange? Why this country? How is this something you can't do in the US? It is important that you make a case for how your exploration goes beyond the institution of graduate study. And for most countries, you also have to be accepted to the university program, usually a separate process. This is what most Fulbrighters do, hybrids. Most have some connection to a university, academy, or institution in which there is some structured class or workshop learning, perhaps as a guest student, plus some sort of independent mission, a burning question guiding their exploration. Usually to do this effectively, RISD applicants have secondary affiliates, which get them out into the community, exploring, practicing, and applying their skills and learning. Let's move on to the Fulbright resources. The Fulbright website is extensive. Everything you need is there. But because there's so much to navigate, I'm going to give you a tour and highlight the most important pages for you to review. First, be sure you're on the Fulbright US Student Program website, not the Fulbright Scholars website or Host Country's Fulbright website. Make sure it says US Student at the top. Probably the most exciting pages are the country information requirements found here by region. For example, let's look at Peru. Here you'll find the award profile and grant link, anything in particular they are looking for in candidates, such as disciplines, area of focus, or degree levels. Of course, you'll want to check out the language requirement right away. Any restrictions or preferences on affiliation will be listed on this page. And you may find a link to the host country website and additional country-specific resources. You may even find an email to an actual human you can reach out to. Process information is found under the Applicants tab, Application Components. Choose the grant, Creative and Performing Arts. Here you'll find each application component with drop-downs that include considerable details on instructions and tips. Visual material requirements are found under Supplemental Materials. The visual materials are not supplementary. They are required and very important. Click on the link to Required Materials. You get to a list of the Fulbright disciplines with drop-downs to the requirements for each. You will have to choose a discipline. There is no multidiscipline option. It's not that you can't have a multidisciplinary practice or project, but because there are so many applicants, they have to put you in categories. So you will have to choose what best fits your project and consider your audience. The link to the online application, which opens in early April, is found here. Fulbright offers webinars April through October under the Applicants tab under Information Sessions. These are one-hour sessions in which you will hear from Fulbright experts and hear questions from your peers around the country. It is important that you listen to at least a couple of these. I listen to 10 to 15 every year and learn a little something new each time. It is also important that you hear from Fulbright directly to confirm what I'm telling you and to provide you with new perspectives. If you see one that you're really interested in but miss it, make note. Then go to recorded webinars to listen in. You will also find webinars from previous years here. I am often an applicant's first go-to, but know that Fulbright program officers who work for IIE are there to help you. Sometimes I don't know the country-specific answer. There are 140 countries, so it will be best for you to email or call the program officer directly. Their contact information can be found by going to Contacts in tiny white font at the bottom of the page. Also in tiny white font, at the bottom you'll find a link to a page of interesting statistics. You will find applicants and awards for each country. I did the math here, and in 2020, 2021, 35.7% study research projects were awarded in the Czech Republic and 20% in Denmark. By no means should statistics solely guide your choice. If you are passionate about a country and your project is a great fit for that country, don't look at these statistics. But if you are open, the statistics may help you make a decision. You may want to poke around in the statistics and consider a less competitive country. Obviously, English-speaking countries are the most competitive. The UK is by far the most competitive. If you speak another language, consider how that might be an advantage. And if you speak French, maybe instead of France, which is quite competitive, consider Benin, Morocco, or Burkina Faso. If you don't speak another language, consider a country like Latvia or Norway with no language requirement, or Laos or Malaysia that have more flexible language requirements. Learning some of the language is still important to these countries, but because their language is not commonly taught in the US, they are more flexible. Also in statistics, you will find a link to the top producing institutions. 
RISD students and alumni do very well in this competition, and RISD is a top producing school in the specialized institution category, with 91 awardees who have explored their creative projects in 42 different countries. Under the alumni tab, you will find a grantee directory with Fulbright alumni across the country in all disciplines. I did a search on sculpture in India, which resulted in 13 Fulbrighters. There is not a lot of information on each Fulbrighter here, but the directory may give you some project idea leads or help you determine the country's interests and maybe even lead you to someone to contact. Fulbrighters are often happy to talk to applicants about their experience. But when looking for Fulbright artists for inspiration or support, I suggest you start at the RISD Careers website. Scroll down to learn more about Fulbright and then to the RISD Fulbright Showcase. You will get to a site of RISD Fulbrighters, over 35 are on the site. In stories, you can read about their projects and you can connect with them through their website or see what they are up to on their Instagram. In the Experience Gallery, you can see some great photos of their lives and the people they worked with while on the Fulbright Grant. And in the Artwork Gallery, you can see both what they submitted to receive the grant and the results of their projects. This website is a great place to go for inspiration and make connections. But for the nitty gritty, how does this actually happen for RISD students? Go back to the Fulbright section of the RISD Careers website. There are two very important documents to guide your process, the checklist and deadlines and getting started. First though, consider will you be applying through RISD? If enrolled or an alum who graduated in the past three years, you have the option to apply through RISD but you're welcome to apply on your own, which Fulbright calls at large, and it is not seen as a disadvantage by Fulbright in any way. Know that the pro to applying through RISD is you'll receive intensive support throughout the process, but the con for you may be you must follow RISD's internal deadlines. We require that you submit in mid-August in order to receive feedback, have time for fine tuning, and resubmit. Fulbright's national deadline is early October. Our internal deadlines are in place so we can effectively, efficiently, and fairly support all of you through the process, but they are also in place for your benefit. We know from past experience that applicants who start late really struggle and then decide to wait until next year, which is fine. Lots of applicants have false starts and come back stronger than next year. This is RISD's checklist and deadlines, which you saw earlier. This is just the first page of this document, a visual look at the deadlines. This document goes on to provide additional milestones for each application component. This document will help guide your process. Be sure to check out this document on the website for exact dates, but know that the first deadline is the kickstart meeting in mid to late May, where you confirm your intent and country's choice and we ensure you are ready to go. The second deadline is your first draft due early June. And the first submit, if you're applying through RISD, is mid-August. Keep in mind, summer can be very challenging considering that many countries have a culture of long holidays in the summer and holiday means a real break you may find that affiliate contacts are not available, particularly mid-July to early September. And we strongly encourage you to submit documents before the deadlines. This will provide you with earlier reviews, meaning more time to redraft, incorporate feedback, fine tune, and move on to your next draft or another application component. The second important document is the RISD Getting Started. This is the index page. The first thing you'll notice is that it is really long. But consider that this is a condensed version of everything for RISD artists and designers in one place with guidance based on our experience working with many applicants over the years. This is your resource. Take the time to read it once over and then use it as a reference throughout the process. The RISD Getting Started document walks you through each application component with detailed advice. Plus it has valuable information on how to work with me, what makes you a strong candidate, what makes a competitive proposal. So what are the components? Affiliation. Applicants must find and arrange their affiliations. Countries have specific requirements, but it is usually with a university, a profit, or research think tank. It cannot be with a for-profit company. Applicants must build the relationship and then document the nature of the relationship in a letter. Yes, this can be hard and take time, so start early. Just do it. Don't wait for the perfect draft or project idea. Who your affiliate is, what they can offer, what they like in return, will affect your project ideas and proposals. We want to work with your affiliate to develop your project. There are tips in the Getting Starting document to help your search and develop your affiliation. We also have an email outreach template and actual affiliate letters we can review with you during advising appointments. Statement of Grant Purpose. This is a two-page proposal outlining all the details and purpose of your project. Do consider that less is more. 
One thoughtful idea will be more effective than many. The purpose statement needs to be a clear and straightforward plan. You need a focused, unique direction to get busy reviewers on board. How do you do this? There are a number of tools to get you started on project development and writing. In the RISD Getting Started document under the Application Component Statement of Grant Purpose, you can find these prompts to ensure you hit key content. This is, in a sense, a way to interview yourself. You can use these prompts as headers to help you focus, and then as your drafts develop, you will delete and transition. In fact, I often use them as a checklist when I review your first draft. Personal Statement. You have one page to talk about your path. How did you get to this point of applying for a Fulbright? This is where you can be more creative and show some personality. It could be anything, really. It is an introduction to you. Obviously, nothing too personal. Remember, this is a government grant, and it should be directly related to your project. Think of this as a third page in connection to your purpose statement. This is a great place for critical reflection. Fulbright loves critical reflection and seeing that you have an awareness of your arc of growth. What did you try, learn, then realize, and how did that change your perspective, lead you to new questions and next steps? This is also a place for examples and stories rather than a listing like a resume. Deep reflection of one story in your path is better than a list. For both the purpose and personal statement, consider the getting started document, the section on what makes a competitive proposal. For each of these green bullets, you will find a detailed description of what Fulbright is looking for. Read this now at the beginning and keep referring back to it as you develop your proposal. In addition, continue asking yourself the two big important questions. First, why this country? Beyond the institution you'll be working with, if you picked up this project for Singapore and moved it to Japan, is it the same thing? How is it unique to Singapore? Second, how will this experience improve your craft? Beyond inspiration or a new place to practice, what skills are you gaining to specifically improve your craft in this particular country? Language forms. Depending on the country, a language self-evaluation and a professional evaluation may be required or recommended. Three recommendation letters are required. Choose wisely in terms of who will write a meaningful letter and who will be timely. At the applicant stage, unofficial transcripts are required, so you will need to collect these documents, scan them neatly, and upload them into the application. The online application is really long and includes five to six additional essays. Start this early. This is not a last minute thing and be neat and consistent in both content and in formatting. You want to have a strong application package from beginning to end. And finally, visual materials. I have this last not only because it is not because it isn't important. It is. It's extremely important. But you are the experts on this. You know how to do this well. I highly recommend you check out the Fulbright Arts Portfolio webinar found on Fulbright's recorded webinars page. And a few pointers. Follow the instructions. How many? Size, resolution. Make your case with effective, high-quality images. Consider every image counts. Every image should tell a story that supports your purpose and path. You can have some detail shots, maybe an installation shot, but no throwaways. And use collaged images sparingly. There needs to be a reason for more than one view in an image. Otherwise, it seems like sneaking in additional pieces to gain an advantage. There can be a few collage images where it makes sense, but too many is overwhelming and diminishes the look and feel of a whole piece as a single image. Make the connection to your grant project through your images. This may not be the time to submit your gallery ready portfolio. Focus on the fit to your project and consider your audience carefully. Your reviewers are not only artists. Use the image description space to help make your case. Not only title, size, and materials, tell us more. This is your chance to make connections. This is your chance to show your preparedness, yet room for growth. This is your chance to tell reviewers, especially your non-art reviewers, more about your process and ways of thinking. Take advantage of this space. Curate the order thoughtfully for a cohesive portfolio feel. A curated portfolio shows organized thinking and thoughtfulness. It shows you cared about this opportunity. Be sure to start strong to capture their attention and make them want to see more. Be sure to end strong as that last image will stay in their mind as they move to other parts of your application. And in a group review, that last image may stay up on the screen as they talk about your application. You want that image to be strong and connected to what you're proposing. A final tip, print each image you are considering on half sheets of paper and tape them to a wall. Stand back and really look at them together and then move them around to find that compelling flow. The final weeks can be fairly intense, so I'm going to walk through the submission steps with you. If you are applying through RISD, 
you submit the complete application to the Fulbright online system by mid-August. But Fulbright's not looking at this point. I then arrange your interview with, with RISD. And don't worry, the interview is more fun than it is scary, and it can be very helpful. Know that RISD is not a gatekeeper. We submit all applications. The interview's purpose is to ensure you're prepared to carry out your project and provide an opportunity for you to receive additional feedback. After your interview, I submit your application and you have a last chance for fine tuning. This is the time for minor changes, not rewriting. Redeveloping after months of work usually doesn't work out too well. This is the time to make careful, select changes to strengthen. Then you resubmit. I take a quick look to correct any errors. I then hit my submit button to Fulbright and it is done. Art applications are first reviewed by US experts by discipline and semifinalist decisions are announced in January. Semifinalist applications then go to the host countries for review. And then host countries make their decisions. Both governments approve and finalists are announced anytime between February and June, usually in March or April. I've given you a lot of information and resources, but how do you get started? Grant writing is just as much about organization skills as it is project development. Develop organizational tools based on your style to keep track of your research, drafts, and affiliate outreach, and set personal milestones to help you meet the deadlines. Review the country summary pages, which is really exciting, and it's important to find out early on if there are restrictions, preferences, or special requirements. Start drafting your purpose and personal statements early. The first draft, that commitment in writing and the feedback you receive, this is when things really take off. Find help. Ask for help. This is a complicated grant. Find people who will support your application process. Meet with me, but not only me. I'm only one voice in this process. Find someone in your discipline to guide your research and content. Find someone to give you feedback on your image choices. Get a professor on board. Maybe you can even send them a draft or two during the summer. Reach out to the RISD Center for Arts and Language. They are an excellent resource for brainstorming or fine-tuning your proposal. Talk to RISD Global about where RISD might have connections in your host country. A word of advice on getting help? Get advice early on in the process rather than so much at the end. At the beginning, all voices are important. At the end, your voice is important. Last-minute advice can be dangerous as it really can throw you off. Everyone will see something a little different. Well-intentioned advice can send you down a rabbit hole after months of hard work, and it is really hard to recover from that. One more resource for you. On the RISD Fulbright page, scroll down to Tips from a RISD Fulbrighter. Click on Learn More, and you will go to a document full of excellent insights and tips from RISD Fulbrighter to Brazil, Gail Foreman. I want to leave you with a reminder of the first deadlines. Schedule your Kickstart meeting to take place by mid-May. You can make an appointment with me on the RISD Careers website. At some point, depending on the applicant pool, I'm only open for appointments with those applying this year. But RISD Career Advisors Jason and Scott will continue taking appointments for those interested in a future Fulbright application. First drafts are due early June. This is a draft, and there will be many more. But it should be a serious, thoughtful draft, not an outline, not bullets. And in the correct format and page numbers and proof for typos and grammar errors. You don't have to have all the answers for the first draft. Start pretending and imagining. The more thoughtful your drafts are, the deeper I can go in my review to provide feedback that will help you take it to the next level. Be sure to check the Checklines and Deadlines document on the RISD Fulbright webpage for the exact dates. And finally, I want to emphasize what an amazing experience Fulbright is. This is an extremely competitive grant. It is important that you embark on this journey understanding that the process itself is an valuable experience from the research to developing relationships overseas, to writing, to submitting. A Fulbright proposal is a lot of work, maybe the most intense proposal you will ever write. After a Fulbright application, all of the grants will seem easy. And know that it will not be a waste of time. I look forward to working with you. Thank you, everyone. Great. Um, awesome. So just a few Fulbright updates before we hear from Jesse and Mandy. Um, First, some really exciting news. We have eight RISD semifinalists this year. They are now waiting to hear from their host countries, final decisions. So it's a, a lot of waiting right now. Um, second, the 2023 Fulbright cycle will open April 1st. So at that time, the country pages will all be updated. So if you've been poking around, great. But just know you want to set, it some time, set some time aside for April so you can get to see if there's any new country requirements. Usually there's not a lot of changes, but there can be changes. Third, we do have tentative dates for deadlines if you tend to apply through RISD as of today, February 28th, 
The first deadline is going to be May 25th. That's the kickstart intent to apply meeting with me. And then first drafts are due June 11th. So do check the RISD Fulbright website in April to make sure there aren't any other changes. Um, so we are going to hear from Mandy and Jesse next. And Jesse won or lost the coin toss. I'm not sure. Um, but um, I'm going to turn this over to Jesse. You can share your screen and tell us about your project. Cool. Uh, thank you all for having me. Let me just pull up my presentation. And you can all see that. I will assume that that's a good to go. Um, all right. So just as a brief introduction to myself, um, I got a BFA from MISD in textiles design back in 2016. And my work in the textiles department was always focused on materiality and structure, um, specifically in knitted and woven constructions. So um, as far as my career trajectory, this carried me through this sort of thought process and interest in structure and material carried me through several years in industry. And so I worked as a textiles designer and materials engineer for four to five years before considering applying for the grant. And the reason why Fulbright for me seemed like a great option to move forward was because I was really looking for a change that would shift me more towards creative practice and academic research. And so to talk a little bit about my Fulbright application process, I wanna start with a little analogy that I actually heard here while I was in Taiwan. And this is sort of to indicate that there are a lot of different ways to approach how to develop a compelling grant. Um, and the analogy here is bricklayers versus gold miners as a metaphor for different ways of approaching research where a bricklayer might be someone who has a framework premeditated for how to construct a project. Um, and what they do is they find the bricks and lay them on top of each other to build the foundation. And so that might look like something where for your Fulbright proposal, I know specifically I want to study puppetry in Paris. Um, a miner, on the other hand, starts with sort of a block of earth and mines away, revealing gold underneath. And I feel like my research process was a little bit more of this mining excavating approach, um, a process of discovery um, where the idea itself was sort of being revealed as I was beginning to like survey the landscape. And so you'll get a sense of that in the next few slides as well. Um, so the starting point for this project for me was that I had actually gone to Taiwan once before back in 2019, um, and this trip illuminated the presence of art, design, craft in Taiwan. Um, these are just some images from that trip, some photos of landmarks, food, architecture, and art spaces. Um, and I think that once I had gone on this trip, I sort of was inspired in thinking, oh, I want to go back there. And uh, simultaneously, I had learned Mandarin Chinese through exposure from my parents, who are both from mainland China. And um, this was sort of coupled with the desire to go somewhere where I could personally improve my language abilities. Um, and that being said, the language ability, uh, my background in Chinese also has helped me immensely while I was here. And so it helped with the application process and has helped through the whole grant period. And so once, um, once I knew that I was going to end up in Taiwan, I wanted to apply for a Taiwan Fulbright. Um, I began doing research on Taiwanese crafts specifically, um, looking at the textile space, looking at what um, universities, research institutions were doing work in Taiwanese textiles. And I stumbled ac across mm, this institution, the National Taiwan Craft Research and Development Institute. Um, I saw that uh, among all of the craft disciplines that they specialize in, which include bamboo, lacquer, stone, woodworking, ceramics. Um, they also had a fiber craft studio and I was thinking that's for me. So I delved more into what they specialize in on the textile side. Um, and among the list of things that they specialize in, uh, knot making and uh, natural dyes piqued my interest. Um, Part of the reason for that is because the RISD textile program and my experience in industry focused heavily mm -hmm. on weaving and knitting, but um, not making a natural dye processes are uh, at that point were still very, very new to me. I didn't know much about them at all. And I felt like these two processes also captured specific aspects of Taiwanese craft culture um, and also provided more of like an entry point in terms of engaging with how the craft ties to the history, geography and culture of Taiwan. And then so as far as uh, process, uh, the application process was pretty straightforward as 
far as developing the affiliate relationship. Um, I just reached out to them through their contact us page and then through a series of emails, was connected to um, the right point of contact in their technical division, and then I began an email correspondence. Um, one thing to note is that a really important part of developing my affiliate relationship was through communicating through visual means because there was a, a language barrier in terms of engaging. Um, we were talking mostly in English, but um, I was mostly making these uh, like inspiration decks, uh, creating visual references so that they could really get a sense of what I was interested in doing. So you can see here, this is one of the decks. Um, this was sort of beginning to develop the sort of visual language, the formal structural material quality is that I was interested in exploring. And then lastly, sort of like what the final outcome might look like, the idea being that there might be a, like an installation where I'd be hanging textiles and sculptures in space. And then once I was communicating with them through these slides, they were able to give me really concrete feedback as well. And so these are just quotes from our email correspondence, but things like uh, feedback on, oh, like what would be specific project execution goals and outcomes and so this led me to creating like more explicit learning goals more explicit definitions around what the installation might look like um things like uh facilitating communication so um they were corresponding with me on like oh is it better to communicate via email we can also set up video conferences let us know what works best for you and then lastly, um, they're really supportive because they expressed general excitement and positivity towards the potential relationship um, formed throughout the grant period um, and beyond. So um, the, the host was really like a very supportive point of contact throughout the whole application period. And then another thing to note too, was that I actually applied twice to the grant. And the first time I applied, I was selected as an alternate or waitlisted. So I applied again. And during that whole period, um, which was a pretty long period, having applied twice, the host was just really, really supportive and encouraging. So then um, coming to my actual project in Taiwan, um, my project is called Tying the Friendship Knot uh, because it's a project about knot tying. And to speak a little bit about, um, again, that approach to materiality and structure, uh, this is some work that I was doing prior to the grant. And um, so like these are some textiles that I developed from a material standpoint. There are these materials that have luster and sheen. And then from a structural standpoint, um, this is a plain weave textile. It's inherently three-dimensional in structure, but um, because it's three-dimensional, it enables a sort of like iridescent effect where as you change the angle of view, the color also shifts in the textile. So the images on the top are the same textile, just uh, photographed in two different angles. And so I was like really interested in this sort of like interaction with light, this interaction of structure and material. And so um, that was a lot of the sort of same thinking that I was beginning uh, to apply towards my project in Taiwan. And so these were some of the first experiments that I was working with. These were some knots that I was making. And um, at this point, I was just using any material that I could find. I was beginning to sort of learn more about traditional materials in the craft space, such as rami, jute, uh, bamboo. But I was also just going to the hardware store. And this is something that I found at the hardware store. And then simultaneously, I was also taking photos um, like all throughout my experience, just walking around. And um, I became interested in this idea of a net, both as a textile construction, but also as a metaphor for something that both contains and entraps, as well as functions as a medium of porosity, allowing light, air, and water to pass through. And so a lot of the images that I was capturing sort of either address the formal or uh, metaphorical aspects of that. And that shifted the direction of my project a bit. Um, it brought in the scope to include not just not tying, but also weaving. Um, and I felt like weaving was also a, a way in which I could um, use my background and expertise to help support my affiliate, because a lot of the time that I spent on the loom, um, I was also able to do demos on how does weaving work? How did these structures get made um, for classes and workshops that were happening concurrently with my project? Um, and then a lot of the things in my initial proposal still held. So um, while I was focusing on like weaving, interlacing, knotting, um, I was also looking at those sort of like natural dyes, looking at the relationship between the 
the stuff of the material and their uh, like natural origins. So looking at sort of the ways in which indigo plant species grow in Taiwan and how that pertains to the color that is produced in the fibers. Um, and then simultaneously also exploring different types of novel materials. So these sort of like plastic cords were ones that I also felt like were very unique to um, Taiwan. They really have this like sense of ubiquity in the Taiwanese landscape, the visual landscape. And so you see this all throughout the city, even in the countryside, you see this plastic material. And so this idea of like materiality combined with structure was something that was like always sort of a recurring theme in my work. And then even throughout the grant period, I was communicating through visual references. I was doing a lot of diagramming and drawing just to communicate my intention, my exhibition goals. And then I um, recently installed this exhibition. Um, and uh, this was actually installed just last week. So I was pretty busy uh, just doing lighting and doing all this hanging hardware. But um, I think that in communicating with the with the affiliate on my goals throughout the process, they were able to sort of like have confidence that I was able to execute on this. Um, and then right now it's March 1st. So um, something about my application was that it was also divided into two parts. The first was primarily focused on this exhibition and the second, which um, is sort of the next three to four months were left more open-ended in my proposal. So that's something that I actually felt was interesting in my application process too, this idea of like, is it okay to leave something more open-ended? But um, that sort of time, like what the next sort of coming months will look like for me was actually something that um, my affiliate really helped me make more concrete because they were also beginning to connect me with other universities and companies to develop new projects. And so that's something that I'm beginning to do research and development on now. And so uh, in the last few minutes, I want to just talk briefly about my life in Taiwan. Um, I really appreciate sort of the community engagement that my affiliate has. Um, they function as a craft research institute, but they are also really invested in bringing Taiwanese craft to the youth. And so these are some activities that they have ongoing um, throughout, uh, throughout my time there, but also this is part of the programming that they try to arrange every year. This is the workspace that I have. This is the weaving room. And there are many different types of looms that I had access to. And then lastly, I've been able to travel a bit. I've been able to explore sort of the beautiful landscapes that exist in Taiwan. And so that's been really, really wonderful. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wow. And it's really fun to see. I haven't seen your work from the end of you. Well, in mid experience now. So it's really fun to see that exhibition and everything in your work there. So great. Jesse and I've been working, worked for what, four years? <laughs> so so it, um, yeah, it's really exciting. Great. So thank you. So we are going to turn it over to Mandy now and then we'll um, do some questions. So don't leave yet, Jesse, um, for your day. I know it's only almost nine o'clock in the morning, but um, I'll turn it over to you now, Mandy. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. okay. So I am Mandy Lee. I graduated from the glass department, uh, MFA in glass last June. So, um, I'm going to talk about my project, Czech Glass 1948 to 1989 to now. So I wanted to start out with these two images. Um, these sculptures are by Yaroslava Britova and Stanislav Lebensky. And I have to say that they are kind of, these sculptors were my gateway into Czech Glass and my interest. Um, I saw these about 10 years ago, but um, my gateway into sort of wanting to be working in this specific country. Um, so some things that I was really intrigued by these sculptures were um, they are monumental in size. Um, they have a really interesting history in that um, they were, um, these sculptors operated mostly through the communist era and I was really curious to see 
how glass making in terms of how it was thought about, the technologies that were used, um, how that kind of shifted from that period post 1989 to now. So this kind of really began with a question um, and also being an architect, the scale was, was something that was really intriguing to me. And I think, um, you know, having lived my entire life in the US, I also really thought that it would be important to kind of study and research these questions in context. And while the political um, situation is very different now, um, just being in the place would be really interesting. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about my experience with the application process in general. Um, so I started looking at this grant about 2019 um, when I was a first year graduate student and ended up um, ended up not applying until 2021. So headed into my um, final year at school. And what I wanted to talk about a little bit, oh, I guess one thing that I wanted to say is that um, I think this whole process, like I did not come into starting the application process, having a super clear idea of what I wanted to do in Czech Republic. Like I knew um, I was really interested in this idea of like the technology, the evolution of um, response to political histories, but that sort of crystallized throughout the entire process of writing the grant. Um, so don't, I guess don't let that be discouraging if you, you feel like, you know, you're interested, but you're not quite sure what it might be. Um, and I wanted to, in particular to touch on post-country affiliation, because I feel like that um, can be a little tricky. And um, I'm sure you asked, you know, it was really great hearing Jesse's experience with that. And I know a lot of people that I've talked to have had really different experiences of how they approach that as well. Um, so something that I found really helpful was working with faculty at RISD. So one of my professors I knew is a, a fellow Czech glass enthusiast, and she was really helpful. Um, she, she knew many artists that have been working there, um, or I guess working here, that she was able to um, sort of direct me towards. And I was able to kind of, you know, research some of their work and learn about their approaches. Um, and so around mid-June, I think I started to, um, so I don't know if you can see my mouse, but um, middle of June, I was able to start making those connections, um, just emailing, um, kind of knowing that I had a lot of time in the grant to kind of um, figure some things out. So it was nice to connect with them or my current affiliate to sort of piece together the project. And Jesse, it was interesting to hear how that process also, you know, crystallized things for you as well. Um, so what does a Fulbright look like? Again, lots of different people have so many different experiences. So uh, for me, I'm located in Zlín, Czech Republic, which is about a four-hour train ride from Prague, the capital of Czechia. Um, and I am living in the middle of an active industrial zone, which is really interesting. I uh, see things being made sort of right outside my window. And it's um, sort of... A 1930s functionalist 
factory town. So you see sort of these vestiges from that, which is really interesting. And with community engagement, um, I've become, so I'm, my affiliate is a professor who's the head of the glass department uh, at a, at university, university uh, Tomaj Bati. But um, what's been really exciting is being in the school and working with the students, which is not something I anticipated originally, um, or I guess not to the extent that I'm working with them now. So um, I've, you know, they get to see what I'm working on. I get to see what they're working on. And so we sort of have this um, working weekly crit, which is really exciting. And I'm doing a project with some of them now. Um, and this is one of their gallery exhibitions, some of their work that glass is made with uranium, which is kind of exciting and terrifying. Um, I also wanted to mention that uh, I found the international students group a really great resource to meet a lot of different people from around the world, which has been really interesting and exciting. Um, but also they've, the group has been really helpful in kind of connecting me with language, uh, I guess language classes and language resources. My country did not, Czech Republic did not have a language requirement, um, but I've, I've always wanted to learn another language and I think just, kind of in this setting, it made a lot of sense to do that. So um, international student groups are, can be really helpful. Uh, so my, for my project itself, I've kind of laid it out into um, a research component and then developing work that's in response to that research. So my affiliate has been super generous and super helpful with connecting me with um, different curators at fine arts galleries, at, or sorry, at um, fine arts and applied arts museums. Uh, this is like a design fair in the bottom, like an arts and design fair in the bottom left, uh, connecting me with different artists and galleries. So that's been really fascinating. And in addition, um, being able to visit different factories of different scales, so different scales of production, um, some more arts leaning, some more product oriented. And then also uh, being able to use some of their resources, or I guess um, have access to hot shops and special glass working facilities. So for me, what that looks like, it's um, I'm able to access a facility every other week. Um, and this has been, this experience has kind of opened up my work in, in a way that I had not anticipated and in really the best way. Um, this is the hot shop that we're working at. And it was started in the 40s for um, to, to train students to work in the factories, some of which don't uh, exist anymore. So that's been really interesting to kind of learn that history um, in the context of some of the political and um, uh, technical histories that I'm also really interested in. There's some of the things that we do there. They were a lighting factory. So there's these amazing repositories of light fixtures from the 1800s through 2003 when it uh, closed down. And they also have a collection of these steel molds, which are just amazing. Um, and again, like mostly from the 1800s 
to some middle 1900s. And some of these have really interesting histories, like um, this flame is rumored to possibly been used to make lighting for the Titanic. Um, so I've kind of been finding ways to incorporate these into my own art practice and kind of uh, thinking of these as like sculptural units and kind of doing some experiments with that. I think just in terms of time, um, I will just scrub through this video. Do it like, ooh, okay. And some, some tests. And thank you very much. That's what I've got. So I'm happy to answer any questions about the process um, that may have thank come up. You. Thank you. Both of you are like just so fun seeing the photos of your experience, what's happening, where your work is going. Yeah, it's really, really super cool. Thank you so much for, for putting those slides together and showing us a little of your life and, and what it's like. Thank you. So um, maybe I'll start off with some questions. Um, all right, I'm gonna just start out. So I have one question for each of you. So Jesse, one of the things that I know when we were working on your application, so Fulbright is really looking for like, why this country specifically? So if you pick this project up in Taiwan and you move it to uh, Japan, is it the same project? And obviously not starred in other places. How did you make this Taiwan specific? Uh, yeah, one thing to note is my internet connection is like a little bit unstable right now. So I will try to answer your question. Hopefully it will be cohesive. Um, okay. You are correct. <laughs> you are correct in noting that, um, like decorative knot traditions are present in a lot of different parts of East Asia. So, um, a lot of decorative knot knotting actually China, but it's also in um, parts of Korea, parts of Japan, and of course in Taiwan. And so, one aspect that um, I was really interested in is not just the sort of like formal structure of the knots, but the way that the materials that compose the knots are relevant. And so, in all of these different places, the material, the stuff that makes the knots is different. Um, in Japan, they use a lot more paper materials, a lot more natural materials. In Korea, there's a lot more emphasis on traditional colors because they'll be part of like the costumes and the ceremonial garments that they make. And in Taiwan, I think there's a really close tie to the, um, to the, the landscape. Um, Taiwan is a subtropical island, so there's a huge diversity of flora and fauna, and so the materials that um, are become those knots are also reflective of that. So they also are using a lot more natural materials, natural dyes in terms of these forms, and so that was something that really sort of consolidated Taiwan as being a, like an important place for me to do the work. And if I recall, I mean, you have two pages to write the purpose statement. Um, you have to really show your research in a very, very short space that you know what you're doing <laughs> and you can't talk about all these differences, but you have to really make that case um, really fast. Um, so thank you. Um, and my question for Mandy is, I recall at some point there was, you know, there was sort of the industrial places, there's fine arts places, there was um, more of like a production kind of commercial there's lots of places that I, I remember at one point we're like oh my god there's all these places like a reviewer can't even get their head around all these places and you had to really manage that scope how did you decide and just get this down to something that your reviewers could get their heads around one of the things that I think um really helped was I don't remember what stage we talked about it, but kind of having part of the proposal being kind of baking things down. Um, so working through that with my affiliate and identifying places to go to um, so that at that beginning stage, it wasn't 
overwhelming. And I think sometimes, I mean, you obviously you're doing different things, more things than both of you thought you would be doing. And it just has to, it can't fit in the two pages. It just can't. <laughs> and so you have to just know that it'll happen. Things different, lots of different things are going to happen when you're there, but somehow you have to get everybody on board in two pages. So that leads me to a question for both of you. So what have you found? Um, we'll start with Jesse. What have you found to be the most surprising? I think something for me that was really surprising is I felt like the proposal that I wrote was like very explicit and um, very detailed. And I sort of have a, had a idea of how to execute that when I got to Taiwan, but there's just so much that became like very adaptable and changeable based on the resources that were available here. So for example, I um, met a woman who worked at the Craft Research Institute and she was an expert in indigo dye. And while I had initially thought, oh, most of the technique development that I'm gonna be doing is around knot tying, I actually spent a lot more time researching indigo because it was just so interesting and she was so knowledgeable that I didn't wanna have a rigid framework for saying like, oh, despite this wealth of expertise over here, I'm gonna just focus on the thing that I promised I would. Um, it really is just, it was surprising how much unveiled itself to me once I actually got here. So, and, and it's been a, a great surprise, a very pleasant surprise, but that was very surprising. Great. Thank you. Mandy? I think for me, it's, I'm surprised at just how generous people have been with wanting to share knowledge um, in really different ways that I expected to, because sometimes I'm like, there's a pretty big language barrier. And so a lot of that knowledge that is shared isn't always verbal. Um, which has been really interesting. Some of it's like through, you know, sometimes we, you know, do Google Translate or there's someone physically that can kind of um, be like a language conduit, check to English, English to check. But um, some of the ways that I've learned to communicate, I think is, has been really interesting but you still share ideas, which is, I don't know, kind of magical. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to imagine. I mean, it's almost like both, but as you're thinking about this on paper, it is so different when it's in person with real people and day-to-day, -day. I mean, you, you live there, <laughs> you're not paper. <laughs> Great, so we do have some questions. Yeah, do you wanna, yeah. Alan? Yeah, should I should I hop in here with a, with a, a few? Um, yeah. So um, so, <clears throat> pardon me, for Jesse and Mandy, um, Joe Kim asks, how much support did you receive once you're there? So if you're seeking related classes at a university or looking for peers or just any other technical aspects, does anybody check in or does anyone guide or check in with you during your time there? Or is it basically, you know, you're on your own? Mandy, um, you want to go? <laughs> sure. So in my experience, um, it's been very, uh, we, my affiliate and I, as well as like other instructors at the school, um, were in, we're not in constant communication, but I would say like there's some conversations per day. Um, and I think Part of that has to do with, I work primarily at the school. Um, I know some of the other Fulbrighters um, that I've met have had really different experiences where um, like they are not seeing their affiliates as much. Um, so I think, I think it varies. Yeah, Jesse? Yeah, I would say on my end, it's pretty independent. Um, the 
it was also sort of a little bit ambiguous what the working relationship was going to be like. And so my affiliate basically asked me, how much support do you think you need? Do you want like monthly check-ins? Do you want it more frequent? And so that was very fluid. But I think that um, I probably see, I probably have like specific project related meetings, maybe about like every two weeks, sometimes every three weeks. So it's pretty loose. And then I don't know if it's the same for you, Mandy, but in Taiwan, there's also a Fulbright commission. So there's my affiliate who I work with my project, but there's the commission that helps coordinate everything Fulbright. So there's, uh, for me, I had an orientation and some informational material on just like how to get around. There's support in that way, but a little bit similar where they sort of like, okay, we gave you a we gave you a lot of resources, um, go forth. If you do have any questions, if anything comes up, then just feel free to contact us. So I feel like a lot of it is independent, but there's like a lot of fallbacks if you need. Super, thank Mandy, you. Mandy, does the Czech Republic have a commission that is active too? They do, yeah. We had um, an orientation that was for several days at the beginning, and we just had a mid-year conference where we all um, all the scholars and students and ETAs sort of shared their work, which is great. And then we'll have something at the end. And they kind of check in with us, um, like the, the Czech Fulbright Commission has kind of been pretty communicative. Right. I think the overall answer, you know, when you're looking at 140 plus countries is, it depends. <laughs> it's going to depend on the country, the Fulbright Commission, the culture, the resources, all kinds of things. Um, as you might imagine, we have one of the Fulbright Hers who is in Turkey right now. And so there's a very different situation happening there and kind of a big a big shift. Um, so yeah, I think things happen, things happen in the world, um, but there is usually a, a Fulbright commission and then there is your affiliate. So you have those kind of two supports. You know, as we're talking about, um that interaction with the organizations that are um, there to help you. You know, I'm going to skip around a little bit because Kevin asks, um, are you connecting with other Fulbrighters in the country while you're there? Um, if so, was it only at the beginning, like when you got your orientation and things like that, or, you know, as it continued through the experience? Um, Jesse, if you don't mind. Uh, sure. Yeah, I would say that um, the orientation was a place where I met a lot of the other uh, research fellows and scholars. And the way that we've been able to stay in contact is just we have like a like a messaging thread and then people will post on there some research related stuff, but also just like, oh, like what foods are you enjoying? Like, um, like 7-Eleven is like just everywhere in Taiwan. So like, what's your favorite 7-Eleven snack? Like, <laughs> what do you think about like? the milk-based garlic bread, things like that. So I would say it's like a pretty good community, but right. then there's also like people that you meet outside of Fulbright and that's great too. So a good balance. Super, thank you. And Mandy. Yeah, yeah I we also have a, a group chat for the Fulbrighters and it's, it's similar like, you know, what are great, good places to go? Um, I also found it really helpful. Uh, we started talking before, I guess we had like um, a meeting in April, all of the Fulbright students, scholars, and ETAs. And we were able to start a group chat then, which was really helpful mm -hmm. with talk with just discussing uh, the leasing situation. So renting apartments, which is a little bit different here than what I was used to and uh, getting things set up like banking, cell phones, et cetera. So just like, like stuff. Yeah. Life, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you. Um, so Maxwell asks, um, well, for one, Maxwell, thanks you both for your presentations. And the question is, did you plan for or facilitate any community engagement outside of your institution. Um, and, and I'm just going to jump in please. Sorry, but before before please. you answer that, just remind um, people that there is, you have your project, you have your personal statement, but there also is a piece of this where you actually just can talk about how you're going to engage in the community, not 
you know, bigger and broader and not just in, about your art and design or your project or your affiliate. Um, there's actually a space in the application. So it is really important to Fulbright to know that you are not, you know, if, if you were a scientist, that you're not just going straight into the lab and you're never leaving your lab, kind of as a very basic example. Um, so it is really important to Fulbright and there's a place in the application. But yes, now I please answer. Um, Mandy, you can go first. Thank you for that, Lisa. Yeah, I did have um, a completely different community engagement plan that uh, didn't necessarily pan out yet. <laughs> Um, I've become a lot more engaged with the students than I, I had anticipated, but in, in a good way. So, um, but think, yeah, think things change, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think on my end, my community, my community engagement was like a very specific in my proposal because I had this sort of supporting idea that textiles would be like a platform for tactility or non-visual, non-auditory modes of engaging with aesthetic experience. And so something that I'm doing that is like pretty independent of my current affiliate is I'm reaching out to people who are engaged with like the low vision, blind and deafblind communities in Taiwan. And that's more organic. It's like less sort of formalized under my project proposal, but it's more just like reaching out, talking with them, seeing what exists here as a form of support network and then like the second part of my project is looking more like how do you make these textiles that sort of like service that mode of um engagement so that is more informal but it is something that happened outside of my affiliate and i mentioned that in my proposal as well Super. i think part of the reason that fulbright has this question is that you know they don't get to interview you um some countries interview you but it's it's a very short brief interview and it's more project related, but they don't get to really talk to you. So they want to try to picture what you're going to do, like what else you're going to do. And so the question is there just, so it might not actually be that you end up doing it or you kind of doing it on the side or it happens later, whatever it is, but they're just trying to, to, to see how you might just be a human in the community that you're in. So, there, so, um, and Marie is asking, um, about budget. <laughs> so shifting gears a little bit, um, do you have to plan um, a detailed budget as part of your proposal? Is that is that a big part of it? I can give I can give you a short answer and then I don't know if you two want to add about you know how this is all working. But the short answer is no, there's no budget. Um, obviously you want to be submitting something that's feasible. You wouldn't want to include a lot of you know big expensive supplies or equipment, but there is no budget will break gives you a monthly stipend um, depending on the country. So yeah. do you two want to? And can we that? add also, forgive me, um, Lisa, can we add, is this monthly stipend covering everything too? So if you, if you don't mind adding that to it. Jesse, yeah. you can go. <laughs> um, so I would say that this is sort of variable country by country as well, but um, the stipend that we get for the Fulbright in Taiwan, I would say is pretty generous in terms of covering the cost of living, um, just because the cost of living is a little bit cheaper here, definitely compared to the United States. And I know that that's different for people who are doing their Fulbrights in Europe, um, it might be a little bit more constrained. Um, and I would say like the biggest sort of expense is probably going to be your rent. But I found that um, sort of being a little bit selective and careful about looking for a place to rent and then also just sort of even if there's no budget mapping out how you'll be spending your money in terms of supplies, other expenses like getting around, transportation, um, eating, um, any sort of travel that you might want to be doing that is sort of like more like the leisure tourism side, all of that. It's good to have a sense of that ahead of time. But I would say if you do that, then the stipend is able to cover everything that you need to do. Awesome. I think that I, my answer would mirror Jesse's as well. Um, I haven't had that many big financial issues come up. Um, one thing that I think did help because the work that I do requires special equipment was just seeing with my affiliate, like what I would be able to access, if anything. Um, and 
he's been really generous with um, helping me access certain equipment um, and some equipment that the students work with as well. So mm -hmm. that's been, there's certainly a lot of out of pocket expenses, but I'd say that the stipend was generous, um, but it is taxed. So, um, and I think that might, I'm not sure if that's country to country, but it's just something to keep in mind. Yeah, that's thank great you. to know, actually. Thank you for the, the extra <laughs> tip there, for sure. I, I didn't budget for that initially, mm -hmm. so now, mm -hmm. now I am. <laughs> Lessons um, learned, right? <laughs> yeah. So are, are you both still good time-wise? Should we just take a couple of more questions, maybe three? Um, so I'm saying three, there's actually two in the chat and I have one. <laughs> so, um, uh, so, um, and Marie, if I'm saying your name properly, I, um, forgive me if I'm not, um, also wishes to know, is there a specific format that your final research has to come in? So could you write a book or can you make a series of painting, for example? Um, you know, where's the, where's the flexibility level there? And Mandy, if you'd like to start us off. Sure. So I think there's a lot of flexibility. Um, for me, I proposed um, exhibiting the work in some way. Um, I didn't outline necessarily like what that would look like or how that will be. Um, but I think for, yeah, my, my deliverables were mainly doing research and then having a body of work that responded to that mm -hmm. and being able to share that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And Jesse? On my end, very much the same. I think the it is very open-ended and something, I guess, as part of context is, I would say that for Taiwan, the number of arts grants are very few compared to the number of other sort of like research study grants. And so everyone else here, aside from someone who's doing music composition, is a PhD researcher finishing one year of their dissertation. So the deliverable there is like very explicit and straightforward. And I think the Fulbright Commission, who is going to be reviewing the application, is really familiar with that kind of outcome. So I think like just coming from the arts background, it can be super open ended. Mine was also an exhibition and sort of like uh, uh, an artist talk. but. Um, just being explicit and sort of describing what that might look like for uh, an audience that is more used to just seeing like research papers, um, I think is really useful. But that being said, I think super open-ended. I, I know someone actually who did write a book during their proposal or part cool. of a book, so. Cool. And, yeah, and I'll just add that, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go no, ahead, Ellen. Well, I sorry, Lisa, I, I'm just being inspired to like wonder, and you don't even have to answer this question, like, the, the how do you decide what to bring home or ship home because mm -hmm. like i'm thinking about mandy and glass versus you know what jesse's working on and like that maybe that's something that you have to like consider on the front end because like that that could turn into an, a very unexpected expense that you mm -hmm. you're both inspiring this thought so um and sorry lisa i didn't mean to take that no yeah, I don't know if either one you want to respond to that, or are you just hoping not, you know, I don't want to think about that yet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry. Dude. Yeah. My work has grown in scope and weight. So uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's probably a good thing to yeah. consider. Before Try not then. to think about it, right? <laughs> yeah. There's like a, currently in our chat thread, actually, um, a conversation about what's the cheapest way to ship things back. Yeah. Um, and I definitely have acquired among sort of like my art materials, the things that I've made, um, a bunch of books um, that people have given me, resources. Um, so mm. I haven't crossed that bridge yet, but it is going to be something I'll have to factor in. Yeah, for sure. No, I'm glad I'm glad that you you inspired that thought. Um, so I'm I'm curious. So Mandy, I have a specific example for you. I'm wondering if you got to see these glass pieces that were you were inspired by. And then Jesse, like your location or locations, have you been able to dig into any collections um, that you would have never gotten a, a a chance to see had you not been able to get to this Fulbright, um, you know, achieve this Fulbright award? 
the there is an incredible archive dedicated to those artists work right down the street from where I lived and I did not know that going into this wow. so that's been really incredible they have the original molds they have Whoa. some yeah it's it's pretty pretty crazy um and then up north they have or they have there's the factory that or I guess sorry the studio that produced the work so I haven't been there yet but that's that's on the plan. Incredible. Yeah, cool. awesome. And and Jesse? Yeah, I would say the same. Like the wealth of resources here is just incredible. And I think part of that is like library collections, like collections of past exhibitions, um, like physical samples of materials. Uh, the specificity of like materials that exist here, I think is something that I didn't even know existed until I landed. And then I would say also just like there's a lot of information that's like contained in like the muscle memory of the craft, like in learning indigo dye, there's like this way that you like pull on the fibers to like allow more air to penetrate because indigo is like a process of fermentation and oxidation. And those are things that like you'll never find on the internet, you won't find in a YouTube video, you won't find in a textbook, especially not one written in English. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's just been so incredible being here. Yeah, that's amazing. That's that's so cool to hear. Thank you for that. Um, and you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna skip around. Would, how about one last? Because um, uh, somebody else has has chimed in here. So I know we're out of time, but right. Um, would love to hear how Mandy's work slash scope has changed since she started. Also, like, should we connect? Like, should this person try and connect with you online? You know, um, to to try and handle that. And that definitely goes over to Jesse too. Like I, I heard a little bit about the shifting in, in project and process. Um, so should we talk about that a little bit and then maybe people can reach out if they wish to, to get more information? Yeah, definitely. Okay? Maybe we'll close there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely feel, please feel free to reach out and we can talk more in depth. But um, as Lisa mentioned, that was something that, because it's basically like, I mean, it's not this, but it's like, what's the history of glass in like nine months? So, and then mm -hmm. how do you define that? Um, so as I mentioned, like part of this process was kind of paring down what to focus on. Um, uh, I've found it really inspiring um, kind of learning about, so the region that I'm in is called Moravia, um, and a lot of the glass knowledge that I've come across is from another region, um, mm -hmm. and I think even here, the glass knowledge about this specific area that I'm working in is not as common, and so I think I've found a lot of inspiration to kind of focus on uh, learning more about this particular history and um, some of the methods that were used to make glass here. Um, and I'm really fortunate because I'm working with some uh, glass blowers that are from several generation glass families. Yeah. Um, so it's, I would not have been able to, to kind of, I guess, guess that though, yeah. before coming awesome. here. Awesome. Cool. And Jesse, why don't you, if you want to chime in there and, um, and then I'll, you know, step aside and turn things over to Lisa, if that's cool. Cool. Yeah. I think I alluded a bit to, um, the change in my projects though, but, um, I will say that a lot of that was sort of like resource dependent in a lot of ways. Like, I think that being able to be like fluid and dynamic about how things change and sort of what you can learn from while you're here is really, really important. And it was interesting because when I landed at the research center, they actually had a couple of faculty retire. And so there are some places where I was not able to 
draw resources from that I had originally planned on. And this was part of the whole like two year application process having applied twice. And then part of it was also just like, there were new people working there. There was someone who happened to be hosting a workshop at the time. And so just being able to like shift my project in a way that was able to like leverage this experience to its greatest potential in terms of like how much I'm able to learn there and also in the ways that I can give back. Like I wasn't planning on doing a lot of weaving, but it ended up being like, there are people who are just really interested in the process. And so I was like, okay, I'll just put on a warp. I'll show you how this works. And so it became part of the work too. Great, really great insights. So awesome hearing from you both. And I just want to say, you know, to everyone out there, I mean, I think you have to, to go through the Fulbright process, you have to write this very specific two-page proposal and all the pieces that have to come together. And it, it can feel kind of rigid, and partly you have to do this so that Fulbright can distinguish what, what it is you want to do. And if you all said, I just want to have a great experience and see where it goes, which is kind of what Fulbright is about, how would they know who to give the grant to? But I mean, that really is the heart of Fulbright is that they want you to go, they want you to be there, you want to have some meaningful engagement and really see where it goes. But again, you do have to have a plan in order to get out the door and just see what happens then once you get there. So um, yeah, it's, the application itself is quite a process. And then once you get there, things can be a little different and be thrown out and start over. But Fulbright loves artists. And I just wanted to mention that too, that you, know, you have a really engaging visual outcome. And so Fulbright is really excited about having artists in this mix. Um, artists tend to be engaging. They tend to you know, be active in their communities and then they have something in the end. So. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's a, it is a competitive grant, but I think our artists do stand out and do really well in the competition. So. Thanks, Lisa. And I, just to say, I, I shared a few links in the chat. Um, I shared them at the beginning. I, they're the same things I just shared here. Some of the things that um, Lisa was referring to in her presentation. Um, Jesse, Mandy, I don't know if you have a, a quick link or two like to your to uh, your work, like I'll, we'll stall for a second. If you wanna, if you have anything you wanna share in the chat, just send, make sure you send it to everybody um, cause that's a choice in the Zoom platform here. Um, so if you hit send, people can grab that on their way out the door, the virtual door. They're both, Mandy and um, Jesse are on the Fulbright Showcase website. And as Mandy and Jesse know, I will be bugging you when you're back to, to get some new, new photos from your experience up there, but we'll wait on that till you're, you're back and settled. <laughs> and I have an almost live website, but it's still in the birthing process. So <laughs> I will, can't drop, drop that in the chat now. But. No pressure here, no pressure. <laughs> well, you, you should be spending your time in country and taking in everything you can get and not working on websites. So there. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Mine are all just like informal ways of reaching out. But if you have any questions, you can feel free to reach out to me on any of those platforms. Cool. Right. Thank you. That's super generous. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for, for being here, participating, asking really great, great questions. Um, the video tutorial is always up. Again, it will be updated in April based on anything that changes with Fulbright. Not expecting much. Um, and the event is, will be recorded and can be found probably within about a week on our event recording page. So um, do reach out, ask us questions, and yeah, we're here and happy to help. <laughs>